So hey everyone, it's Emma Darcy back from the Marketing Success Summit and today I have another wonderful guest. I have Victoria Mary Clark with me today. So Victoria, welcome and thank you so much for being a guest today. Thank you, Emma. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I have to say this is amazing actually because you know, Victoria is somebody that I've really wanted to talk to for quite a period of time. Um, I just give people a background because I know we've got quite a few listeners from the States and indeed from the UK and different places around the world. But Victoria is an amazing person, very well known in Ireland. Um, she is a media mogul, you could say. But she works in, you know, but like you, you, you have worked significantly in media all of your life. Yeah. From two ends of the scale in that you have your partner is um, a very famous rocker and um, yeah. we say um so leader of the pogues um and you, you have to say the name of the song that's so famous because i can never remember the full name <laughs> so, uh, it's called fairy tale of new york yeah and I think I most that's probably their, their most successful song um but yeah the, the pogues are so yeah good band yeah, so you know I think, you know, you've become, being, you know, Shane's partner, obviously, you know, he's got his level of success and you've seen kind of behind the scenes in terms of how the whole media operates and I guess the good and the, and the, and the bad parts of it as well. Yeah, that's true. Um, there are some bad parts. You have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> like not good. <laughs> but I suppose, you know, just to give people a sense, like, but you also write extensively. Mm. Um, yeah. for magazines um, you've done photo shoots you know you've, you've quite a background in media over the last um, number of years and um, you know what I would you know just from speaking to you you know you've just got a wonderful way of you know even we were speaking the other day and you were able to you know to structure a story and just talking about a number of things that people need to do um, in terms of their PR and I suppose today's talk really is about, you know, Victoria obviously giving all the rest of us um, some tips because, uh, you know, and we were talking about this the other day, but, you know, media is so important. Um, and I think yeah. because social media has, you know, become important and it still is important, but I think people have forgotten traditional PR. And yeah. Victoria is going to show us today why, um, you know, traditional PR is still significant, still important still important in the context of legacy, in the context of, how, of positioning and how people perceive you in the marketplace and how that affects um, positively, um, hopefully, um, you know, your sales. And, you know, you know, you've got a really good presentation to show people and to demonstrate also different things that they can do that can help them with their PR. So I'd just like to put it back to you, Victoria, um, in terms of, you know, can you, do you want to start off there and just give people a sense of, you know, what you feel is important and um, kind of, you know, when people are starting out and what they should be looking at um, if they're thinking of kind of diving into um, traditional media? Yeah, shall I just um, run with the presentation? Yes, please, actually, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose one thing just to say before I start about the dealing with the more negative side of the media is that the more you're familiar with the media, the more you've built relationships and the relationships that you can build are basically the same as you would build with your local greengrocer or your local plumber or, you know, anybody really that you get to know. We're all essentially human beings. I mean, we do forget this, but it is true. And so if you build good relationships with the media, then if something slightly negative happens, you can, you know, work with people. You can have a conversation and see if you can turn it around. Um, I had the experience um, early on in my career, I was working on a biography of Kurt Cobain and his band Nirvana. And um, Kurt and his wife basically got kind of annoyed with, with me. <laughs> they didn't really like what I was doing. And they phoned up one night and Kurt basically threatened to kill me. Gosh, <laughs> I was kind of nervous because, you know, I wouldn't put it past <laughs> to actually do it. And when I went to the police, this was, I was living in Seattle at the time. They just said, well, there's nothing we can do until he's, you know, until he does something or if he does something, because if you don't, <laughs> what can we do? So I went to the media and I had, uh, there was a friend of mine, Tim Apello at Entertainment Weekly, and I just gave him the transcript of the conversation that, mm -hmm. Basically, they had left it on my answering machine, which was kind of handy because I could just give, 
<laughs> you basically got death threats from Kurt Cobain yeah. of Nirvana. Yes. Your answering machine. Wow, that's yeah. a great story. <laughs> they're, they're quite they're quite ferocious. Like he yes. didn't pull any punches. So that actually ended up working very much in my favor because I gave it to Entertainment Weekly and they printed the full thing across two full pages. So that was advertising that I would have never got had, had that not happened. But also it meant they got picked up all around the world. So, you know, it was in the Washington Post, the LA Times, New York Times, all the London Times, everywhere, all over the world. Anyone who's interested in Kurt Cobain was interested in, like, right. you know, who's he threatening to? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it must have been a baptism of fire, though, to, to just go yeah. writing for somebody on somebody else, like their biography, to suddenly being center fold, if you like, yeah. in, in yeah. a story like that. So what was that like? So it was interesting because I learned that um, very quickly how to how to spin the story. You know, I wanted to come across as, as the victim and the good guy, you know, and the little helpless journalist, sweet, you know, um, wouldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> so like, you know, we, me and my, my co-writing partner, she was actually also a magazine editor, very experienced. So we both had a bit of experience with how the media works and we had a lot of friends in the media. Mm -hmm. So they were on our side. So it was quite easy to spin that story. <laughs> it was like no, no when, negative outcome. When you say you spin the story, I mean, in some ways that could have negative connotations, but, you know, spinning. Um, but just, I suppose, just give people a, a sense of, you know, what did you need to say to your journalistic wow. friends that would help them to, I guess, adopt a story in your favor, if you like? Well, we, we didn't have to work very hard, to be honest. We we just said, look, imagine if this was you. You know, you're a journalist. It could have been you. You could have been in this position. You could have been, like, writing a book, and then all of a sudden, sure. someone decides they don't like what you're writing. So we kind of, we, we use the censorship angle quite a lot. We're like, you know, they're trying to censor us. This is yes. not, like, you know, anti-freedom of speech. Um, so people were very interested in that part and they were interested in the fact that we were quite young at the time, you know, or in our early twenties, we were, you know, inexperienced in that world of, you know, big corporate rock stars. Of course. Uh, so it was kind of like a hero's journey story. So you, you always try to create a bit of a story that has classic story elements. Mm -hmm. So the classic story is always structured with the hero being you know, up against something really big and really horrible and lots of obstacles. And the hero is the nice person that you identify with and, and they have all the qualities that you admire. And maybe they're a bit vulnerable, you know, and a bit small and helpless and they have to get, they have to learn to be brave, <laughs> pipe back. And so, you know, you just kind of subconsciously create a story mm -hmm. with you as the center, central character. Yeah. And so you can do that for anyone. Yeah. I'm just wondering, though, have you any tips for people? I know you probably covered some of this in your presentation, but for somebody starting out and, you know, trying to decide, like, so, for example, if somebody has a product, for example, yeah, and, you know, do they put their story? or Because this is often the dilemma, you know, for, for business owners. Do they put their story or do they put a story that's just about chocolate? you know so which can be boring obviously so you know there's only so much you can say about chocolate as nice as it is <laughs> yeah well let me put let me ask you a question when you think about airlines which of the airlines has a human being attached that you can you know something about and you can relate to well i think ryanair with o'leary i mean i don't know him obviously but he is obviously um like a, a person he's a character right yeah, yeah absolutely so regardless I mean, of whether you love him or hate him you know who he is <laughs> and even if you hate him it doesn't really matter does it because you still know who he is yeah correct yeah, i mean yeah. is there a character behind Aer lingus I, I couldn't actually identify it to be honest yeah i'm sure british, there is british airways yeah yeah i i again i should know from all my case studies but i can't recall no. their name off the top of my head no or even if you go global, like, is there a character behind Thai Airways? Is there a character behind Pan Am? You know, really, the, the main character is Richard Branson in the world of flying. So he makes sure that he's everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, we've all seen the pictures of him with his balloons. We've seen him, like, in all kinds of weird, crazy situations. So he's very much front and center, and he's built a story about his company, which is all about him, really. Mm -hmm. So it's always good if you have that kind of character. 
Yeah, that's true, actually. So I suppose then it's it's kind of representing your company in a particular way and having that um, personality. And and I guess the thing is, um, or would this be fair to say that you know we don't know um, Mr. O'Leary or Richard Branson, you know, but we get snippets of who yeah. they are. Yeah, we do. And I suppose we get bits they want us to get, but they also, we also do get the bits that they might not really want us to get. You know, like when they fall in the sea or when, when yeah, people yeah. are annoyed with them. We get that too. Mm -hmm. We get the whole thing. But I mean, this, this um, basic pr principle can translate into any type of product that you're selling or any kind of service you know you might be making shoes uh, we think of like certain people when we think of shoes Christian Louboutin comes to mind because he's a strong character and he likes to put himself in the picture but it's all, very often the way with fashion designers you know they they're we know a bit about them because they right. like the attention yes yeah and that's really helpful yeah yeah, there, there's some good examples. Do you want to start your presentation, actually? Because I know you, you yeah, um, sure. I'll put together do that. Some, some content that will just help people. Because I think this is an area that people know they should be doing, but yeah. they're kind of avoiding. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're yeah. going to help them, or you're going to help them not avoid it any longer. <laughs> yeah, it's true. People do avoid it. So I'm just going to share the screen so you can see the presentation. And I'll take it back to the start. There we go. Slideshow. Oops. I have to go all the way back to the start. Don't worry. So you're getting a bit of a sneak preview now. We are indeed. You did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> it's all about getting your business famous. But you might sometimes have to get famous in order to get your business famous. I'm not saying you have to, but sometimes it helps. Sure. Okay, so who am I? Um, I'm a life coach as well as a media coach, which means that I do take into account what you're like as a person and what, you're, what motivates you. So you might be the kind of person who says to me, oh my God, I'm too shy. There's no way, you know, I ever want myself in the papers or, you know, on telly or any of that. So if that is the case, and if you want to work on that, we can work together and see if maybe we can eliminate some of those obstacles and, you know, look and see what, what your beliefs are that might be holding you back and might be saying to you, oh, no, you know, I can't do that. Because quite often people just come out with, well, I'm not good enough or I'm not prepared enough or other people do it better than me. And once we've worked together for a while, they realize that they are good enough. <laughs> And that other people don't necessarily do it better than them and that the way they do it is perfect for them mm -hmm. so there isn't like a hard and fast rule that says you have to be really effervescent or you have to be really funny or you have to be really um adventurous or any of those things you can be yourself mm -hmm. and that's what we actually want so if you're even a very shy person that can be really charming you know that could be something that we will think is lovely so really, it's important to remember to be you. And, and that's something, I, you know, the life coaching aspect is really about delving into your personality, what motivates you, but also what could get in your way and what can we do to work, you know, to work on those things and to get you motivated. Because if you're not motivated, you know, like you said, a lot of people want to procrastinate, don't they? Oh, yeah. That's so, one of, I think entrepreneurs in particular, there's a, like <laughs> a raft of them. We kind of have to nail that. I mean, like when I was starting out in business, before I got into journalism, I had a clothes shop and I went to my local um, entertainment magazine and I said, look, I've just opened a clothes shop. Do you want to write about it? And they were like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and that was the first person I approached and I just went into their office. Yeah. So I think that, you know, once you eliminate those problems of being shy or insecure or, you know, procrastinating or any of those things you'd be amazed at what you can and will do yeah it's true as somebody once told me you know i told them you know i was shy or whatever introverted and they said you know what i mean you've got to get over yourself get over it yeah. <laughs> get over it and that's just jumping in you know? yeah yeah, yeah. So i suppose the other thing that's helpful for me um in doing what I do is that I have been a journalist for quite a long time, like 25 years. <laughs> so um, I've got a lot of experience 
connects with different types of people mm -hmm. and with helping different types of people to shine um, and to bring out the best in themselves and in their story. And I think that's very important that, you know, there are certain kinds of people who love attention and they're going to be quite easy to work with, but there are all kinds of other people in the world that we want to know about and they're just maybe a little bit shy and they just need a bit of help. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of something that I've, I've been doing with interviewees for a very long time. So I've gotten used to how to get the best out of people and how to get them to relax, mm -hmm. you know, and forget about well, trying to be perfect because that's really important as well. You're not going to be perfect. No one is. Um, and I think once you get yourself, you get your head around that, you're really on track. You're really on track. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So I've been on television a lot myself. So that's another thing that I find is helpful because I, I know what it's like to be really, really, really terrified. I remember <laughs> the, first time, the first time I went on the Late Late Show, I was so scared that I brought along a Reiki practitioner who Reiki'd me up until the moment that the curtain opened and I and then basically pushed me through the curtain. <laughs> I'm <in> Reiki. <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> yes, because when I went out there, it was completely chill. I, was, I really enjoyed it. It's just like, wow, this is so easy. It's just like being in someone's sitting room. And I think, um, <laughs> the other thing that worked really well in early on in my career was was hypnosis, being okay. hypnotized to feel good. So these things, you know, there's always tools and tricks you can use. I mean, obviously, there's alcohol and various other things to <laughs> if all <it's> fails. <laughs> Well, like, take it from me that having having had the experience of using the more natural methods, I think they're probably better. Um, so yeah, like I said, I've been on lots of lots of different TV shows, and so I've gotten the hang of. Partly, one of the things a lot of people get um, hung up on is what they look like, mm -hmm. and especially women. So they're more concerned about, you know, what are my legs like? What is my makeup like? What's my hair like? Do I look terrible? And it's very distracting when you're thinking about what you look like. So it will affect how you come across because people will kind of sense that you're very distracted and they'll sense that you're not really there, that you're busy thinking about your hair and your makeup. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to get some practice in mm -hmm. before you go on telly and get to see what you look like so that you can get over that part. And like, you know, if you feel that your hair is really shit, go and get it, you know, get some different styles, try something that until you find something that works and try different makeup, try different clothes. So you're actually very comfortable or as comfortable as you can be with your body and your looks before you go on live TV or, you, you know, that makes sense, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you don't be pulling your skirt down or... Yeah, yeah, all that fidgeting. It's just, it's just that we tend to sense what you're feeling because mm -hmm. we're quite sensitive beings. You know, we, we, rel we sort of, un we subconsciously, we pick up your body language and your, and it will affect the way you speak. It'll affect the, the you know, the pace. Uh, it'll affect just how relaxed and warm you are because if you're relaxed and warm, then we like you, you know, it comes across. Mm -hmm. So I know that kind of goes like, it slightly contradicts what I said earlier about it's okay to be shy, but it's okay to be shy, but we do feel it, you know, as an audience, we tend to feel that. And if you can get around it, it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I've, I've been an author, I've been a radio presenter for four years now. Um, and I also channel angels, which is very helpful because I ask the angels to guide me, but also to guide the other person. And we do little angel meditations, which have been incredibly effective at, to bring in the people that you're meant to connect with. So instead of having to do all the work of looking up who's the producer, who's the presenter, who's the director, we just do this guided meditation that connects you energetically with all those people in advance so that it makes it easier it just kind of like smooths the path and you'll find that opportunities will just start to come to you instead of you always having to go to them mm -hmm. <laughs> um public speaking is another thing i teach and it's very helpful because when people go on television obviously they're in that situation of having to speak and sometimes people just speak too fast and they don't speak clearly enough and that's that's important you know you got to you have to be understood because um 
you want you have something to sell right so you you need to be able to communicate yeah. i think that's something i definitely have to really watch is speaking too fast um um, I've had to really slow down, you know, because there's times where I've literally spoken 90 miles to the dozen. Yeah. And, you know, it does not come across well. And even though you might know your subject matter, if the people listening don't only catch a quarter of it, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not very helpful. <laughs> well, they might think, oh, she seemed nice, but I don't know what she was saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because I remember once I did a, a webinar and there was a lot of content and in my efforts to, you know, explain it at length, everything. So I kind of probably put like an entire semester worth of uh, oh. content into like one session. And I, I yeah. tell you the story where this Chicago lady, like is really, she's a good friend now at this stage. And she's like, my God, Emma, you know, it was like turning on the power hose. <laughs> you know, you just turned on the power hose. And like, just when she said that, that image of the power hose where I was yeah. like, blasting people away just they could not you know take it in so i, I think you know what what you're saying is really true um about slowing down and as you said yeah. the pronunciation of yeah. words and stuff it's quite hard to speak too slowly i mean i don't know if you've ever tried it <laughs> i did actually I, I i once i was recording a video and you know the way you can get those rolls like a as if you're doing the news there's one yeah there's a prompter you can get it's a free one online so I put it over my computer on another computer and it was going so slowly. I was like this. I was literally going, hi, my name. And in my mind, you know, it was gone forward. And I was like, God, it's so slow. Um, but it was actually a good exercise. Because yeah. It, and you could speed it up for you, but it, it started off with that this is the recommended speed that you should speak at. Right. Um, and that was a shock to my system now. There is no doubt. So. Um, it's qprompter.com if anybody wants to try Very it. Very useful, free. yeah. Um, but it, it's a good to practice because, yeah. you know, like I, I genuinely was shocked at how, how slowly I had to speak, genuinely. And it, it, as you say, it's really good to practice. And I will practice mm -hmm. with people and get them to be really boring as well. Mm -hmm. That really helps because people are afraid of being boring. But if I say to them, look, just be incredibly boring, like be as boring as you can possibly be, then... They, um, they relax because they're like, oh, okay, it's okay to be boring. And then after a while, they realize they're not actually boring at all, but it gives them permission to be boring. That's actually an interesting one because, yeah, there is that thing, am I too boring? Am I not funny? Am I yeah. not paying enough? Or, uh, yeah. It's fear-based, really, isn't it? It is fear-based. Yeah. So I guess these are some of the titles that I've worked for over the years. And what's useful about this is that they're very varied. You know, everything from, I actually did some of the more tabloid ones in England as well. You know, um, I won't even mention the titles. But um, so I've worked from, from the very, for the very highbrow, you know, the Times and the Guardian, and also the very lowbrow, you know, that we won't even mention. And also I've worked in other countries. So, you know, Italian Vogue, French Vogue, um, and American, the, the New York Daily News. Um, so there's all lots of different styles lots of different editorial styles and lots of different demographics but there's always a universal theme there's always something that connects any piece that gets published and that's a good story that's compelling enough and has the human element usually so we're looking for stories about human beings we're looking for stories that can inspire us or surprise us you know, there might be something really surprising. We'll get onto that a bit later about what it could might be about you that's interesting. But um, I suppose what I bring to the table is the vast, diff, vast number of different types of editors means that I know um, that there's always a way to get to an editor. There's always a way to appeal and using the different, the different styles. Mm -hmm. um, so really, you might be asking yourself, but why would I bother using the mainstream media if I've got the internet? You know, if I can use Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And like we were saying earlier on, the mainstream media hasn't gone away and people are still consuming it. So if 7 billion people worldwide are listening to the radio and 3.5 billion are watching TV, 2 billion reading a newspaper, and only 
only 3 billion are using the internet, it means that some of your audience are probably or possibly not online. Mm -hmm. And another thing I've noticed is that people tend to pick up magazines and newspapers in all kinds of strange situations, uh, like at the dentist or at the hair or the beautician when they've got a bit of time on their hands and they're possibly not busy doing something else in fact they have time to kill quite often if they're waiting in the dentist surgery so there's some really great moments when you can capture people's attention and just you know entertain them and engage them and if you get some publicity in a newspaper or a magazine of course you can then go on to share it on social media so it's like saying, you know, here I am in Time magazine, here I am in the New York Times. It's not just the, um, the numbers that you're reaching, but it's also the kudos mm -hmm. of being associated with those publications. Because if your readers, if you're aiming it at the right demographic, you'll have got the publication that your readers are into. So they'll be like, oh yeah, I love The Guardian. So it's great that you're in The Guardian, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think you can really um, reach more people now than ever with the mainstream media because we're all on social media as well. So it lasts forever. You know, in the old days, you might have been on the cover of Time magazine. Well, you know, we would have thrown it away the next week, be gone, or it would be like just dumped somewhere. But now, because you can share it on social, you can keep sharing it for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's always going to be there. It's part of your digital footprint. Mm -hmm. So if you can get yourself into one of the prestige um, publications or, or shows, that's always going to be part of your legacy. And that's something that we didn't have before. That, you know, that capacity to share forever. <laughs> so another really, really important thing that most people don't realize is that you are not doing us a favor when you approach us. Uh, sorry, the other way around. <laughs> we're not doing you a favor. You're basically doing us a favor because we're actively looking for copy all the time. We're actively lo looking for content and copy. So even Anna Wintour is actively looking for content and copy. And you might think, oh, Anna Wintour, you know, scariest woman in the world. But she's still going to be interested. Like if I say to Anna, you know, I've got these amazing beads, they're fantastic check these out. She is going to look, she'll be like, Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah. There might not be for me, but you know what I mean? She's, she's always going to be interested yeah. or look Anna, here are these shoes or the, this handbag or, I mean, if that's her job, mm -hmm. to stay abreast of what's new, what's, what's being, you know, what's being produced. So it's the same in any, um, in any area of media. We, it's our job to know what's out there. So if something new is disc is like being produced and we don't know about it, it means we missed out and somebody else might have got that story. So it's, it's very important, I think, to reframe the media as being people that you can help mm -hmm. as opposed to people who can help you. Does that make sense? Definitely. And I think it's, it's great to hear that because I think when you see like somebody like Anna Wintour, you make the assumption that she's a total bitch. <laughs> Well, that too, but, but she, like she's, she seems, you know, you can't get, get to her. It seems yeah. that it's not possible and that she's completely yeah. out of your reach. Whereas what you're saying is actually she needs all of us, you know. She does. Um, you know, so, and that it's important that we recognize that and I guess reach out to her because what have you got to lose, right? Nothing to lose. She might give you a frosty reception. <laughs> But it's worth it, surely, if, you know, if one time you go and you make, you take that risk and you approach somebody and they say, wow, where have you been all my life? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're actively looking all the time. I mean, I have to find somebody every week for my radio show and I have to find them myself. Mm -hmm. I also have to find someone to write about for the Sunday Independent every week. So it's, it's constant, you know, we, so we kind of need a bit of a backlog, we need a bit of a collection of people waiting to go. Sure. So I'm always interested when somebody emails me, I always look at their email. So it's important as well to think about who your customers are and what are they like. Because if your customers are farmers, they might not read Vogue. You know, it's possible. <laughs> so you might be wasting your time with Anna Wintour. 
And like on the other way around, you know, if your customers um, are in fashion, they, they probably don't read the farmer's journal. So that it's basic stuff, but think about who they are, what they're like, and what do they like? What do they, you know, do they listen to the radio? Do they watch TV? Do they read magazines? Do they read newspapers? And you can find out just by asking them. And that's what I do. I always encourage people to just go out and ask some of the customers that you've already got, say, what are your habits when it comes to media? So that we can then know what to do with you. Does that make sense? Definitely. And I like your analogy of the farmers. <laughs> they might read Vogue. I don't know. <laughs> Um, and also think about how much attention do you actually need? Mm -hmm. You know, do you need to be globally famous or is it actually, sometimes that's not necessary. You know, sometimes you just need to reach a certain demographic and a certain number of people. So you might not need to be on the red carpet, you know, getting yourself everywhere. All the time. God, um. <laughs> <laughs> I must say personally, I would find that actually, you know, a lot of work you know just all that red carpet stuff it must be tedious after a while well you know it depends again on your personality sure, person. absolutely they love like, it yeah it's like can be like oxygen for some yeah. people you yeah. know, it's like the life force <laughs> yeah. and if you're that kind of person that loves dressing up and loves going to parties and being photographed then that's wonderful because they're always um you know diary photographers looking for um, gossip yeah. columnists looking um, in the back pages of all the magazines, you'll see pictures of people at parties. So if you're a person who likes to party, make sure you stand out from the crowd, you know, make sure you're wearing something a bit different and look good. <laughs> um, so like the first question I ask anyone when we sit down to do media coaching is who are you? What's your story? Where are you from? What was your childhood like? You know, were you beaten up and tortured? <laughs> you know, any of that stuff is always very helpful. As we know about Oprah Winfrey, I mean, is there anyone on the planet who doesn't know who Oprah Winfrey is? And I guess we all know a lot about her backstory. So we know that she came from a very disadvantaged background. We know that, you know, a little bit about the sexual abuse, the rape, you know, all that stuff. So she's not afraid to share her story and it really works for her because people identify, they're like, wow, Oprah's really struggled, you know, to get where she is. She came from nothing. She didn't start out with any of the obvious advantages, no money, no contacts, you know, she's black. It wasn't really, you know, it, like the idea of a black woman being the richest woman in America, kind of unlikely, wasn't it? When, when she started out. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And it even seems actually at the moment with the recent political kind of upheaval in the States that it seems to be still, which I find surprising, you know, um, in terms of America being the free, you know, supposedly the leader of the free world, is, you know, how much racism in general and kind of that sort of thing that's still rife um, and that it is kind of a limiting factor for people, be it race or religion or indeed, you know, so whatever it is, um, you know, but I, I yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, do you feel, you know, that people need to be sure, like, of what the elements of the story that they're sharing? Um, do you think, like, you can overdo it or? I, do, I don't think you can really overdo it, but I think it's important for you to decide what your boundaries are because not only will the world get to know about you, but they'll also get to know about everyone else in your life, you know, and so that some of those people might be sensitive. I might not really appreciate you sharing the story about your childhood and the sexual abuse and the rape and all that stuff, you know, because it might have impacted on other people. So I think it's important to think that through. Mm -hmm. And I think Oprah is a person who has really thought that through. She's very, you know, she's very um, clear about her message and what she's about and she's on a mission. So she's on a mission to share stuff with a purpose. She wants to lift and inspire people. She wants people to know that it doesn't matter what happened to you in life and that her ultimate message is that you were, it, it's your choice, you know, what you make of the stuff. You're, you have the freedom to choose and the freedom to be happy and successful and your story doesn't define you. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that's something to think about is, you know, do you have a message? Is there a purpose behind sharing your story apart from getting people to know that you exist, which, which can be, you know, that's useful too. We all want people to know we exist, but if we're starting to share intimate details, it's important to think about the, the repercussions and mm -hmm. also the, the purpose behind yes. it. So that's Oprah. And then of course I say to people, if you've had challenges, you know, if you've, if you're dyslexic, if you're diabetic, if you're, um, whatever it is, anything that's in your way, Richard Branson always mentions the fact that he's dyslexic. Um, a lot of people in business mention their struggles. They mention the obstacles that they've had to overcome. Mm -hmm. Remember Vivian Westwood talking a lot about being a single mother, you know, how difficult that was. Mm -hmm. um, having to like make the clothes with the kids hanging around, <laughs> you know, it was a struggle, right? Um, so we like to identify with this stuff. It, it's important that, that we can feel that, my, I, sorry, my internet connection is a bit unstable, but yeah, so we can feel that there's something, some kind of hope for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I talked a little bit of health challenges. Like this is one of my clients and her daughter has a peanut allergy. So we have already talked about this in the media. We you know, did a piece in Sunday Independent. We also did, she went on Ryan Tuberty. So, you know, her daughter's okay with that sharing her peanut out the fact that she has a peanut allergy but obviously she had to check that with her daughter mm -hmm. um, but if the health challenge is your own it's easier you know so if you've got a, a health challenge there are many many opportunities to share that mm -hmm. i worked as the health i wrote the health page for like two or three years for the sunday independent and every week i had to find someone with a different health challenge so one week it might be someone who was going blind, next week someone who had been paralyzed, you know, next week someone who had cancer, and on and on and on. I couldn't have the same one, like, you know, every, every week I had to kind of like try and mix it up. So we're always on the lookout for people with different health challenges. Um, a nicer thing to share sometimes is your lovely house. And I think we've all seen the Sunday supplements where the person has just the to die for house, <laughs> the one that we, you know, we're like really envious of. And like, obviously this has, this is a double-edged sword because unlike sharing a story about having an allergy or having been paralyzed, um, it's not, um, that sort of thing you don't, people don't envy you, you know what I mean? Whereas they might envy this beautiful, I, I envy this guy. <laughs> You know, envy isn't always the most useful thing to elicit. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to go for the beautiful home thing, it's good to temper it with a bit of struggle. Okay. So it wasn't <laughs> easy for me to get this beautiful home. I had to work, you know, I had to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to make so home. again, the person has to be the hero or the heroine in the story. The hero or the heroine. So it's story. okay for them to have the nice house, basically. <laughs> yeah, but it has to be hard won somehow. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, if you do have a beautiful house, of course, you can get publicity very easily. Just go to the editors of the, the house set beautiful sections and go, here, I've got this beautiful house. And that, that's you in the door, isn't it? And that's all over the world. I mean, I've checked this out literally everywhere, you know, from Bangkok to <laughs> Boston. They all have beautiful house bits in their magazines and newspapers. Um, another nice thing to use is, it, you know, if you've got, if you like these guys, um, the Flynn brothers, they have a company called the Happy Pair, and they're actually twins, so as you can probably tell from the picture. So they've often used themselves in their publicity, just pictures of themselves doing stuff. Uh, and it doesn't ha hurt that they're very good looking, you know, obviously. <laughs> But if you happen to be a triplet or a quadruplet, or if you, I mean, there are so many family angles, you know, you might work with your parents or you might work with your kids or you might work with your extended family. There are many ways you can bring your family into the story. Um, you might like to do one of those bondings 
um, interviews, which are just basically people talking about a relationship. So, you know, could talk about the relationship with your husband or with your sister, your brother, your mother, your, you know, your kid. It's, it's pretty endless, the opportunities for this. Um, I had a lovely family. Called, have you heard of uh, Castle Leslie in yeah. Monaghan? Yeah. So I did some lovely stories with them around family because they had some pretty serious <laughs> scandal in their family. Like the girls, their father, um, he took a mistress while his wife was on holiday. And when his wife came home, he had moved the mistress in and changed the locks. Oh, gosh. <laughs> So the two sisters, they both had different mothers and they grew up, you know, um, <laughs> in the same village, but one of them lived in the castle and the other one lived in a council house. Oh my goodness. So it's kind of a lovely family story. You know, they're still, they're, they're close. So they got over it. Yeah. So obviously if there's something really interesting in your family background, that, that's very helpful too. Although you don't need that, it is helpful. Um, this is Sammy Leslie. So Leslie and she so I got her into the Guardian with that story uh, but she's been everywhere with that story it's a really good one and is she the lady in the house or she's the daughter so basically her father's dead now mm -hmm. uh, but she is the daughter of the mistress okay yeah what an unusual situation I know <laughs> well it's probably not that unusual well, probably really doing that kind of thing um these guys I in fact, there's probably very few people who don't know of Ben and Jerry. I mean, just because it's nice ice cream, but they're a real rags to riches story. They started out in their garage with, I think it was a $12 correspondence course on how to make ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and they built a global empire. So it's a serious rags to riches story. Yes, yeah, yeah. But, you know, if you've got a small company that you've been building, we always love to hear about business success, you know, stories about people having started in the kitchen or the garage and then worked their way up. We love it. I mean, even Steve Jobs started in the garage, didn't he? Sure. So that's a good one. It's like garage bands, <laughs> garage <laughs> businesses. Um, so this is Jack Leslie from Castle Leslie. And so we, there were many angles for Castle Leslie because not only did they have the scandal in the family background, but they also had Sir Jack who started clubbing when he was 85. And he, I went with him to Ibiza for his 85th birthday. And we went clubbing all night long for three, three days. And, and he only died um, last year and he, he was 99, but he was still clubbing. Oh my gosh. That's a really interesting hobby, especially for an older guy. Yeah, of course. But, you know, if you've got a story like that, if you've got something that you do that's really different, something that really stands out, that's just gold for the media, isn't it? So if you're eccentric, I love it. Yeah, if you're eccentric. If you're a bit weird, like you might have like 50,000 pairs of shoes or you might um, always sleep out, out of doors and never want to go indoors, never wear shoes. You know, there's so many different things that, weird about you that that could be a story um and another thing that i like to do with people when when we sit down to talk about them and their story sometimes they tell me things and they think the thing they're telling me is really normal <laughs> and i go wow that but that's actually really weird so they're not necessarily aware of what's weird about them so it's important to have a good long conversation and and find the nuggets of like weirdness <laughs> A word is barometer, so to speak. Yeah, you know, I've got people who are like obsessed with writing code. Um, or I had a woman who was really interested in aircraft engineering. And she actually, that was her former career was as a, an aircraft engineer. She was actually, she would actually have to get into the engine and fix things, you know, in the engine. And she would often be the only woman doing that. And she became a florist later on. It's kind of a lovely... Uh, jump, you know, juxtaposition between yes. the two. Yeah. Um, so you, there might be just something that you might not have even thought of about yourself that's unusual. You might just think, oh, I'm really normal, but you might not be. <laughs> um, it might be like Susan Boyle, you know, just a person who really beat the odds to win because you wouldn't expect someone her age or someone who looked like that to become a pop star. It's kind of, That's unusual. So you could inspire people by having done something that seemed impossible.
seem difficult. Like there was a guy, I think it was this year, who broke the Guinness World Record for the longest barefoot walk. He did 2,000 kilometers around Ireland. Wow. So, you know, things like that, doing something a bit unusual, a bit different, and winning against the odds, inspiring people. Mm -hmm. If you have a lovely husband or a lovely wife, and, you know, especially if they're willing uh, to be photographed, it's very helpful because we like nice family pictures. And um, you've probably noticed that from Sunday supplements and mm -hmm. magazines, you know, wedding pictures, love that stuff. Absolutely love it. And if you throw in the dogs, the cats, <laughs> the kids, the parents, <laughs> then you can really get some nice pictures. And we're really very much a visual you know, society, aren't we? We love images. I mean, it's growing and growing, the desire for images. So if you've got some nice images, work, work that angle. <laughs> um, celebrities, like I suppose the easiest and quickest way to get an editor's attention or a producer's attention is to mention a famous celebrity in your tagline. So when you're sending an email, you go like, Brad Pitt bought my coffee mug. <laughs> And, and they'll be like, oh, Brad Pitt, what, what's he up to? What's he up to? So, or Kim Kardashian is wearing my jewelry. You know, of yes. course, we want to know, like, what's Kim Kardashian wearing? Um, so I've worked, I, I've been friends with Johnny Depp for a very long time, and I've often, you know, worked him into my stories. Because, <laughs> uh, again, he's one of those sort of people that you mention him in an email, and they're like, oh, what's Johnny Depp doing? So it's very useful to add a celebrity into the mix. I mean, this is Shane. He's also a celebrity. He's my partner. Um, and when you put the two together, that's very helpful. <laughs> um, I'm You're quite the Jew, actually, because, I, you know, just so people understand, I, I'm from the area Shane is from, and I don't know him now, I would have to add. I know his sister. But they, himself and Johnny actually are known to go down to Pecan, you know, the pub in Pecan and um, McGrath's. I don't know if you've been there, um, Victoria. And yes. my, my friend was saying to me that apparently they were there one evening and they have been, I think, several times and whatnot. And it's the sort of pub that Johnny Depp and Shane, who've been better known, I guess, can walk in and people even ignore them. You know, they're, yeah, it's, it's, exactly. it's just they let them off and whatever. But of course, some of the girls, if they get to hear Johnny Depp is there in particular, it's like, oh, my gosh. But um, there were some great stories of kind of, well, you know, you know, kind of funny comments to them and are you all right, lads? And, you know, I mean, you can't get a woman and just slagging them. And, you know, so just really nice as well. But I mean, I think they actually quite enjoy the fact that they don't exactly bow and scrape when they come in there. But um, yeah, I, I think that's nice. And I think, you know, like you're saying, the celebrity aspect. But I, I suppose I'm just wondering, we'll say not everybody would have access to celebrity. Um, well, yeah, you're right. Um, no, but that's like, there are always going to be like we have six degrees of separation quite literally so there will always be someone you know who knows someone sure. who's famous no matter where you are so if you start asking around and just say does anyone know like anyone famous that might be helpful you'd be surprised at who pops up mm -hmm. i'm just wondering say you know in your example we'll say that brad pitt used the muck would you suggest using that even if he has some just to grab their attention and get them in there or is it better that be a chain or um, whoever has, you know, that you literally put it in front of them if you meet them and say, hey, I really need to get a picture yes. of you holding this mug. Um, I just so. Two seconds, you know, obviously that's better. It but, is better because if yeah. you do it the other way, people won't trust you anymore. Yeah, of course. You yeah. know, you'll get in there the first time, but after that, they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah that's yeah. that woman. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, you can see how it works, but it, it always surprises me at times, you know, yeah. that, that we're all human and yeah, it totally works. <laughs> it definitely works. Um, Kim Kardashian does a lot of promo, you know, she, she gets a lot of freebies and she promotes things because she gets freebies. Um, and my friend Kat Hogan, she uh, asked Rick O'Shea if he would launch her book and he just said yes. You know, he really? didn't ask for any money. Wow. So there's always going to be someone. Yeah. And that, that got her some publicity. It got her, he tweeted about it. You know, he has a lot of Twitter followers. Mm -hmm. So if you do get a celebrity, it's helpful to then use their Twitter following as well. <laughs> of course. Um, but you've got to get the right celebrity. So like I use this picture of Mick Jagger because, you know, if you're doing a face cream, it's probably not the best thing to link Mick Jagger to. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you have to think, you know, is this person actually going to be a good fit? Are they going to represent? Me? Like Madonna did Vita Coco, and obviously we know that Madonna looks amazing. So the fact that she drinks Vita Coco is good because it's like, oh, you know, maybe if I drink Vita Coco, I'll look amazing too. Um, so yeah, think about that. Think about, you know, who you're using. <laughs> um, we had uh, Bra uh, Kim and Kanye, they came to Ireland and they stayed at Bally Finn, which is in Portlaoise, if anyone um, hasn't heard of it. And so while they were here, they went to the cinema in Port Leash and they were photographed. So this was huge for Bally Finn because it really put Bally Finn on the map. You know, people were like, wow, that's where Kim and Kanye honeymooned, you know, in Ireland. <laughs> so people all over the world now, real, now are actually aware of this place. So it's really helpful for them. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can also become a celebrity yourself quite easily. And people are often surprised at how easy it is. You know, there are always reality television shows looking for real people. Um, there's Dragon's Den, there's MasterChef, there's things like Come Dine With Me. You know, they're constantly with real people to take part. Quiz shows, always looking for real people. So it's well worth your while if you have any kind of talent, or even if you don't. I mean, even if you went and auditioned for Dragon's Den and you were bad, it would still get you publicity. It doesn't really matter. Do you know what I mean? So you don't have to win. You just have to take part. Sure. And people will probably remember you if you're very bad. <laughs> so. Oh, dear. I don't think I'll be going to afford for MasterChef. I do know that. <laughs> I mean, the next thing that I think we're all aware of this is that still human beings are very uh, taken with nudity. And it's something that is always of interest to newspapers, and magazines. So, you know, even if you're not in the prime of your youth and you don't look really hot, you can still get attention by doing a naked calendar. Like I know quite a number of people who've done naked calendars and they've certainly got local attention, mm -hmm. local press. But yeah, I mean, being like really hot, you can sell literally anything. <laughs> Obviously, when you're a bit. Um, and the other thing that people need to do, I think, is to make friends with the media. So find, find them, find them on Twitter, find them on Instagram, find their websites, um, start tweeting them, start communicating with them. And if you do happen to meet them socially, you know, don't, pre don't be shy, go up and say, ah, you know, say what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be like, of course, there's the fear of rejection, but Supposing they're nice, supposing they say they'll help you, mm -hmm. isn't it worth it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like yeah. asking for a date, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you don't ask, you won't get. True, very true. Yeah. <laughs> so if you happen to bump into someone like Graham Norton, whoever it is, just um, say hello and just tell them what you do. I'd imagine he's quite nice, isn't he? Yeah, he's very nice. Yeah, of course. And the thing is, you got to remember, these are public figures. So the chances of them being rude to you in public are very, very slim. <laughs> because if they get caught being rude to you and someone fo uh, films it on their phone or, or takes pictures, it's, it's, you know, it's not going to help their careers. Sure. So they actually, they kind of are forced. They're a bit like politicians. They're forced to be as nice as they can, <laughs> as many people as they can be. So it's, that's going to work in your favor. Sure. Shoes. But don't get carried away. I mean, don't stalk them. <laughs> <laughs> don't turn up in their gardens. No. Like, I have one person who's emailed me, like, over 150 times now in the past couple of months. Wow. And so I've had to put her in the trash. Like, she's going straight in the spa. <laughs> um, and, you know, yeah, we don't want, we don't really want you to phone us at night or at four in the morning or turn up in our houses or any of that stuff. So you, you probably would um, use the same boundaries as you would use with an acquaintance. Mm -hmm. you'd, you know, you'd be a little bit um, discerning about your approach and how much, how much to come on to them. <laughs> it's true. It's like a relationship. Isn't it? It's like a relationship. It is a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, something to bear in mind is that we absolutely, almost all of us, are swayed at least by a freebie. I'm thinking it's a nice one. 
you've got to expand more in this one now. So do I have to send you a car now? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> the thing is, I, for instance, I'll give you an example. I had um, never driven an Aston Martin before. Mm -hmm. I had never written about cars. Uh, but Aston Martin contacted me and said, would you like to drive, test drive our new Aston Martin, the latest model in the south of France, um, and write about it. And I was like, well, yeah, I would. <laughs> I would like that very much because they were taking me, you know, free holiday in the south of France in a beautiful villa. And I got to test drive the brand new Aston Martin. Fabulous. So, I mean, of course I was going to work that bit harder to find somewhere to sell that story. And I actually got it on the cover of the Sunday Times car magazine. Nice. Because they were interested in, an, in somebody who didn't know about cars writing about cars for a change. Right. <laughs> so I, you know, I did work a bit harder, but I got the story and I got the freebie. You know, I didn't get to keep the car, but I did get to drive. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if you think that a certain celebrity would like what you're doing, they might, you know, if you think someone might like to wear something you've made, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's really well worth investigating the possibility of giving them something. Mm -hmm. You know, if you got clothes or jewelry of course if you can get someone like Kate Moss or Kim Kardashian or or even someone like Amy Huberman or whoever it is the local person that you meet getting them to wear your stuff and get photographed it's worth you know many many times <coughs> what you paid to make that thing usually sorry that a bit of <coughs> um, and I would tell people to start small <coughs> like start with your local paper or your local radio station <coughs> and work your way up get some practice <laughs> get some glass of water <laughs> you dying on me or something <laughs> we're nearly through we're nearly through um, and be properly prepared so get take some time to go over your story so that you feel comfortable so, you know, you, it's like a, rehearsing a conversation. You don't have to rehearse it with a script, but it's really good to have rehearsed it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I definitely advocate that because I remember one of the first times I was interviewed on the radio and I did know my subject matter, but I froze. But yeah. Not completely. But I, I sounded like somebody that had something wrong with me nearly because, <laughs> you know, these delayed answers. It's like, it was nearly, what's your name? Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I just I didn't completely freeze think of, but I definitely didn't it was not fluid and I got off sweating off the phone going oh my gosh um thank god it wasn't terribly long or anything it was just for a charity thing that I was doing but it really taught me a lesson that you know you have to be prepared and even when you know your subject just to practice for sure yeah um definitely yeah you know and and if you practice with with a coach like like when I practice with people I can usually help people to narrow it down and to get rid of the fluff yes so get rid of the extraneous detail because we don't really need to know about a lot of the stuff that you want to tell us yeah, it's true actually <laughs> and actually big on reality stories and i know i'm definitely um responsible for doing things like that where somebody asks a question and it's like 10 minutes later i still haven't answered it really you know um yeah, whereas I yeah. Think if you work with somebody like victoria you can kind of really focus in and hone in on what you need to get across and it becomes more professional and um, people get what you're saying and you're not sweating as much as you would be no. yeah you're probably not sweating by that stage because you'll have done it a few times yes yeah, yeah. yeah. very yeah. helpful and also you get a chance to listen back and to watch yourself back so you can see what you're doing and what you're saying and if you're doing a lot of like uh yeah uh yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah. Then you know, Ghostmasters is good as well because I think you know, as in things like that, or working with somebody like Victoria one on one. But as you say, where we have these little idiosyncrasies that we don't even realize we're doing them. You know, it's true. A lot of people who come on my show, they bang the table all the time, and it's really like distracting. And it also gets picked up, you know, on the microphones. So we have to tie their hands behind them. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose the last thing to say is be ready for the customers because I did once go on TV to talk about a detox retreat I was doing mm -hmm. and there were only I think 16 places available but I got 300 phone calls 
Oh my goodness. And I wasn't even ready for the phone calls. My flatmate ended up having to take all the calls because I wasn't even like there to answer the phone. So I hadn't thought about that. So I just went on TV and was like, here I am doing this great retreat, blah, 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 blah. Here's the phone number. And then I didn't even think, oh my God, someone's going to have to answer the phone. And supposing 300 people want to go, what am I going to do? Yeah. So if you've got a limited amount of time, you know, like if you're in a, um, a consultancy business and you can only do a certain number of meetings, then you've got to think about that. If you've got a product, you've got to think, well, have I got the production capacity to make a lot of these if there's a sudden surge in demand? Because if the customers come and you're not ready, the chances are they go away dissatisfied and they won't want to come back. Mm -hmm. You can see from these people, they're kind of uh, anxious <laughs> and they're a bit upset. So yeah, be, pre be prepared. I think that's very important. Um, and then the last thing is that what I do for people is I do a free strategy call to find out whether it's actually going to be a benefit to you to have media coaching because some people get on the phone with me and I can tell straight away, no, you're not ready. <laughs> you know, there's other things you need to be thinking about. Um, so I might send them to a business coach or I might send them to, I don't know, therapy. <laughs> <laughs> You have a long list of people that you can yeah. refer them to then. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, again, it's always about having a good fit as well. So some people might not be suitable to work with me. I, you know, I like to work with people that I can get behind and that I'm enthusiastic about. Because the more enthusiastic I, I am about what they're doing, the easier it is for me to work with them. And vice versa, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of all. That's all it is, really. And I do it one-to-one one one, or I do it on Skype. A lot of people need to do it on Skype because they, I'm based in Dublin. But mm -hmm. I also do, um, I do courses. So I take people through everything that we've talked about from the very beginning of like, who are you? What's your story? What's weird about you? You know, what do you want to hide? What do you want to show? What will the advantages be of, of revealing that stuff? And where should you be positioning yourself? You know, which media is right for you? Mm -hmm. And how much? And how often? And, and, you know, basically we cover everything in the courses. Sounds fantastic, um, for sure, Victoria. And I, I'd urge, you know, many of you listening in that haven't thought about this before, how important it is, um, because how you present yourself, I mean, when people first meet you, that's their impression of you. So if you are appearing on TV, if you are speaking on radio or podcast or whatever it is, it is important that your message is is right and flowing. And don't do what I did a couple of years back where it's like, uh, um, yeah, you know, and literally caught on the hop. Um, and luckily it wasn't for business as it happened at the time, but it really taught me a lesson that I know definitely if, if I was pursuing um, more you know, TV or radio appearances, I will definitely be talking to Victoria going, oh my gosh, I'm doing whatever. Yeah. Can you please help me? Because yeah. even though I know my story, I feel, I would still feel I need to refine it. I need to be sure that it ties into my brand. And I think as well to have somebody else kind of objectively stand back and say, no, I wouldn't really use that aspect. Why don't you try, you know, this is the angle that you need to use. And you kind of have this discussion over back um, but equally that, like she's saying, to record, like, you know, a practice session and where you listen back and go, oh, gosh, I need to improve, you know, whatever area it is. So I think it's it's a really good opportunity for people to um, upgrade um, their kind of whole media personality, if you like, um, which is important. It is. It's very helpful to build your profile. And it will always serve you. So even if you become really, really famous for one thing, like I did with the Kurt Cobain situation, like at that point, I didn't really have anything to sell because I wasn't able to publish the book. It got injuncted. <laughs> so it was kind of like, oh my God, I'm well known all over the world, but I've got no book. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, later on, I was able to use that when I went to get another book published. I was able to show them my press cuttings and go, you know, here I am. <laughs> yes, I think you might, you might build your profile and then use it later on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So if people want to contact you, Victoria, it's victoriamaryclark.com. Can people yeah. book online or do you think you can? Yeah, you can go on the website and there, all the information is there and you can 
email me from there or you can just give me a call. Great, fantastic. Yeah. Victoria, you've absolutely covered every aspect that I could possibly hope on, um, you know, traditional PR and media. So thank you so much because that's been very informative. Um, and also, I have to say, you're very engaging. There's some great stories in there. So thank you so much for being on the Marketing Success Summit and for sharing your story and equally for helping people and selling them on the road towards greater media success. Thank you, Emma, for having me on. It's been really fun and <laughs> really enjoyed it. Yeah, likewise. So, um, guys, you know, please do contact Victoria Mary Clark. Um, just a quick story I would share um, with people. I was saying this to Victoria the last day when we did our practice run was when I started off in business. I mean, I was in a business for six months. I had no website. I mean, you know, I had nothing ready because I got business quite quickly. I was quite lucky. Um, and I was just saying to Victoria, I was at, I joined a networking group. You know, you do all these things to check off the boxes. They put they wanted me to put forward for awards, and I just thought they were nuts because I was only six months in business. But in any case, um, they said to me, oh, "You must take part. You must take part." And I was really busy at the time, so it wasn't my focus, and I didn't think it was important from the perspective. It was like I was only six months in business. In any case, um, you know, they asked, "Can you send in, you know, a biography of yourself?" And of course, I penned it, and it, I was kind of a bit, to be honest, I was miffed because I had to take the extra time to write it and whatever at the time. And I had to take a picture, and it was before selfies were, were kind of a thing because I just literally didn't have a camera or anybody else to take it. And I took 52 pictures, and only one did not have me blinking, but they always blink. Um, and I sent it to the paper, hoping, dear gosh, I hope they don't, you know, they won't. I, in my mind, I thought they they might print the article, but they're not going to print, you know picture mm -hmm. so yeah put it out of my head and like well this is only for a local paper bearing in mind and um anyways they did print it and um with so i was a finalist in whatever the awards were um but even my parents this is the surprising to me like people surrounding me like i was in business and they were kind of like what are you really doing you know i mean we yeah. have to get a job type of thing and like suddenly i'm in this paper and you know, they're like, wow, even my mother, who is really cynical, um, was like, oh my God, Emma, that's really good. And it's such a good article. <laughs> you know, and I just said to her, well, I wrote it, you know, because I was so surprised at her reaction. And she, but it's so good. And what, it was like she wasn't listening to the fact that I wrote it, just the fact that it was yeah. in print. In the, the paper. fact that I was yeah. in the paper. Um, so just the reason I share that story is because even now, people refer to me being a finalist in, in that. And this is like six years later. And wow. You know, and it just goes to show the impact, um, you know, and people then, and I suppose where, where it has an impact on your business is you become, to, you're elevated, your status, if you like, the perception of your business is elevated. Yeah. You're seen as being successful. If you're successful, therefore you must be good. People kind of make these kind of deductions. They do. They make a weird connection with that, don't yeah. they? Yeah. So yeah. Therefore, therefore, I must get Emma because she was in the paper. Now, yeah. if you look at it logically, like I took the darn picture myself and I wrote the article myself, but yeah. I was in the paper, they didn't know that. So from a positioning perspective, and of course you don't bore around telling everybody that, so I'm just telling people this because I think as entrepreneurs, they'll understand that the actuality of what you're doing and the perception of your customers can often be completely different. Yes. And in order for people to buy from you, you have to project, if you will, this persona, like people do on Facebook and on social media, let's face it, in terms of filters and whatnot. Yeah, they're always looking happy, having a great time. Yeah, yeah, they're not putting up yeah. crappy ones, let's, let's yeah. be honest with it. So it's the same sort of thing, but I suppose what it does, and it did for me then, and still does six years later, which is quite a, you know, quite funny, is that they, you get more job opportunities. So from that, I got asked to speak at a number of events, and then that snowballed. So it, it just became this thing. And that was just from one article in one local newspaper. And I mean, just think if you're in the national papers, if you're in international papers, you know, people's perceptions are like, wow, you're doing so well. And yeah. you know, from working with so many different business owners, I know where there's like chaos behind the scenes, but they get into whatever it is. And um, you know, the opportunities that arise. And actually just another quick story was um, some friends of mine, and they started a chocolate, um, not even a factory, they literally started making handmade, handmade um, chocolates. And um, they were making them in their house. They literally were like the Tom and Jerry guys. They had, you know, after the recession, they both of them lost their jobs or whatever. And the husband wanted to learn about bread, but decided to learn about chocolates. So he literally was down to that, you know, went on this course, came back, and apparently you, could, you actually dry them with a hairdryer. Apparently you can do yeah. that. So <laughs> it was really funny, but RTE2, which would be one of the national... Um, um, TV stations in Ireland contacted them and wanted to film them. 
And it just happened that there was a, a guy that knew them locally and he was interviewing people in the local area. And they rang me and said, oh my God, um, because the local enterprise board you know, advised them not to do it. Oh. And I was like, why? I mean, my gosh, I mean, you have to do it. I mean, Lord. And uh, so I said to them, look, you have to practice, you know, you have to practice, look, I'll help you guys. And um, they were like, well, we can't show the hairdryer, so just lose the hairdryer. <laughs> um, you know, and you know, basically I said, look, you can decide what pictures are, you know, what film they do. So make sure like if they are, lose the kids as well, because they have three rambunctious boys. And, oh, um, I think that would have been cute, the kids. Well, well, kind of, but they were really rambunctious, so they're quite likely to have been swinging out of the light or something. Yeah, yeah. So, but just from the perspective of that, they kind of had a bit of control over it. So they took pictures, shots of, you know, zoomed in on the top of themselves, just played yeah. taxi. Um, they had the two of them sitting down and talking. So it, it came across really well. But the funny thing was, you know, this was aired like a couple of months later. And the Enterprise Board were the first people to ring and congratulate them and tell them what an amazing job they did. Wow. And, you know, and her mother actually said to her, you shouldn't do it. Because what they were afraid of was because it was being taken in her home. Um, that people would think it wasn't good enough, that people yeah. would think, you know, all these things, which obviously are logical concerns. But I suppose what I say to people is, and, you know, from, you know, the context of your um, presentation is it did wonders for their business because yeah. now they're on national TV, you know, and so therefore they must be doing really well. Therefore, the chocolates must be amazing. Yes, there's all these, you know, it, it, like it, it, it's really astounding. And they got newspaper articles on the back of it. I mean, the Enterprise Board gave them more money. It, you know, it was just amazing. Like the the positivity that evolved from an opportunity that arose that they took. And as I said, people advised them, even their close family, and it's not not in a bad way, but they were just trying to protect them. Yeah. Um, so this is where, like, ideally, they should go to somebody like you. Um, where you know you, you talk them through so I'd advise anybody who's in that situation to please contact Victoria and say hey this opportunity has come up you know what do I need to be talking about you know like she's just kind of gone through what's your story how is it going to play out and it's it's amazing because if you put that like say for instance that did not go out on tv and you just do like I don't know recording and a video and whatnot which you can obviously do as well but yeah. the, imp the impact and the legacy just isn't there no. Um, whereas this is like a national TV station, no matter where you are in the world, it adds such impact and legacy to what you're, what you're doing. And you so, can upload it to YouTube and share it on your yeah. social media. Yeah. yeah. Correct. So again, you know, they're just two quick stories that personally I've come across and um, just even for my own. And, you know, I was, even though I know this stuff, I, I was blown away by the reaction, just even of Kill's family, who suddenly yeah. I was elevated in their eyes, which... Yes. Um, like the thing is in some ways like you're no different than you were the day before of course but the perception is you're amazing now you're yeah. on TV or whatever so do you find that yourself Victoria like when you are yeah. I think people um, assume that I I go to parties like every night and that I've got amazing you know like amazing social life and <laughs> and of course like that did used to be true you know I did used to go to parties every night and have amazing social life uh, maybe it's calmed down a bit now, but it is true that the perception is that you're having this incredible time, you know, because they've seen you on the red carpet, they've seen you at, um, you know, premieres and whatever. Yes. And, and yeah, of course, that that is fun, and, and the glamour is fun too. Um, but of course, as you say, it's not always the, the real truth, is it? There's... <laughs> You know, I'll tell you actually, Victoria, it's funny, actually, I met my aunt um, in Tesco's just the other day, and, you know, normally I don't really talk about my business as such, because I think they just think I'm nuts, but anyway, um, I was saying that I was interviewing you, you know, and um, I wasn't sure if she'd know, you know, because I know that a lot of people would know you in Ireland, but I wasn't 100% sure if she knew, so I said, oh, uh, you said, how are you getting on? I just explained I was doing this event, and da, da, da. I said, actually, I'm going to be interviewing Victoria America. Oh, you know, this is a... <laughs> Wow, that's great! Oh, and apparently she met you in the green room of somewhere, which I can't recall exactly where. And um, but herself and her husband. But I got this like, wow, oh, wow, you know. So your profile is such an Ireland that you know I'm getting this from my aunt, who normally like would not be kind of involved in that sort of stuff. So it just goes to show, you know, all the, the stuff that you're doing. We'll say writing, um, yeah. like in the newspapers, your constant like TV appearances. You know, that you're, you're always in the media in some which way, um, you know, yeah. again, it being journalism or, 
you know, be people writing about you or whichever way it is. And it just goes to show that people have you kind of on a, a pedestal, if you will. Oh, funny. And, but, you know, and I, I think it's so interesting, though, isn't it? Um, that how we can frame or how it, you know, your business or your, you know, your personality or your life can be framed in a particular way. And, yes. um, you know, so I, I guess, uh, you know, have you any last kind of parting comments for people, we'll say, in terms of that? And I guess just as those examples are just to show people how important that it, this is. Yeah, it's really, really, really helpful. Um, it gets people to, to know what you have. And I suppose the main thing to think about is if you've gone to the trouble of making something beautiful, like I keep bringing back this necklace because I just love it. You can't really see it. <laughs> You're going to have to tell us, come on, who, who made that? I know I bought it in Egypt, but it's so beautiful. I just love it. Um, <laughs> but imagine if nobody knew it existed. You know, it's really sad. It's like you're doing the world a disservice if you don't tell them you exist, because it means we've missed out on the chance to have that thing that you've got, whether it be a service or a product or whatever it is. So you might think, oh, you know, it's all about me and I'm just really shy, so I don't want to tell anyone. I'm just going to sit here in my kitchen with my chocolate that I made and I'm not going to tell anyone. Yeah. Um, but then you're, you're like, we are missing out on the chocolate. Yes. And that's really what you have to think about is just turn it around and think about like, what would you feel if the, the people that you make the thing you love didn't want, were too shy to market it, too shy to, to you know, to promote it. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's your favorite designer, your favorite lipstick, your favorite <laughs> shoes, whatever um if that person was too shy to promote themselves then you wouldn't be able to buy that stuff so it's a two-way street you know you're doing people a, a favor by letting them know that you're here and like it's up to them to buy the thing or not you're not going to make them buy it yeah you could try to do that but it doesn't really work <laughs> <laughs> but that's so true and actually somebody um and i often tell this to clients is you know if you're doing a service because even like you say with your life coaching and the media coaching and whatnot as well is what would people do without you you know exactly. your service is needed so without you being there and the thing is if you don't tell people what you do how on earth they will are they going to know they really yeah. don't yeah, yeah. I've seen a lot of clients do that where, you know, they go to a dinner, you know, Stephen socially and whatever, and somebody, like even their next door neighbor says, oh, you know, kind of, they finally get to talk properly and they're like, oh, what, oh, I never knew. And, yeah. you know, and that could be their best customer or they work for a company, you know, there's all these kind of, um, kind of opportunities arise. So you have to tell people what you do. What you and, do. you know, and you are... I suppose not. You're 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 not allowing people the facility or the opportunity to either say yes or no. Um, exactly. And again, many 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 of you listening in, um, you have wonderful services and wonderful products. So please mark them. And definitely, media is a huge underutilized. Um, and it's aspect. free, isn't it? That's the other thing. Yes. You know, it's actually free. Yeah. Which we forgot to mention. Um, you know, if I get a piece for somebody in the Sunday Independent. Um, it would cost them like 50 grand yes. usually to pay for a whole page. Yeah. But that is true because I rang the independent once and I asked about a full page ad and it was probably about 12 years ago and I didn't ring since. Um, and it was 37,000 euros yeah. and, and yeah. that wasn't including the VAT. And I just said to him, I don't want to buy the newspaper. I just want to put in. <laughs> um, you know, but I have to say, I mean, I knew it was going to be expensive, but like that's a lot of very, money. Very expensive, yeah. So, you know, what have you got to lose by getting yourself a full page in a, in a national newspaper? Yeah, totally. And what have you got to gain? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think you'll have converted them, Victoria. I, I really feel you have. Um, so, look, at, again, thank you so very much. I really have enjoyed this interview. And I think there's lots of great um, food for thought for people. And just hopefully they take action and they do something about um, their media and put themselves out there. So again, thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Not at all. <laughs> Bye. Mm -hmm. okay, we're stopped recording. <laughs> Sorry, it went on longer than I, I intended. Sorry. Um, oh, no, it was really good. So that was great. Yeah, well really good. So um, very enjoyable. You're really uh, good at, you know, the stories and all the rest of it. They're great. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Um, they're engaging because sometimes you know I've been obviously interviewing quite a few people and um, 
you know, it's 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 hard in fairness because some of them are more technical. You know, it's not as sexy or whatever the case yeah. is. Um, so, but just it's amazing all the different styles. So you're obviously so used to it. You know, it, it's quite a natural style, which is great. It's easier for me to interview you. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad. It would you would hope, really, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, there is there is that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look, you should look at doing group courses and whatnot. On yeah, that. I think I will. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, well, we definitely have to meet and chat in real life. 